getting deeper into the first process, conduction. Conduction, classically defined as the transfer of heat between substances which are in direct contact and requires a solid medium to be present between the elements exchanging heat. Right, so here's a question for all of us to answer or ponder about to come up with an intuitive response. Looking at a wall which experiences higher temperature on one side, perhaps through a source of heat such as the sun, and here is a, the other side of the wall which is under the influence of a lower temperature, perhaps the inside of a building. Which direction will the heat flow in? Perhaps we will all agree that because the outside or the temperature on the left side is higher than the temperature on the right side, heat will flow in this direction. The mode of heat transfer here, of course, is conduction because it is a solid medium. All the molecules are in contact with each other and therefore conduction is the only heat transfer process that can happen in this situation. This just reinforces the point that conduction always occurs between warmer and cooler surfaces. Conduction is often defined or understood through four different properties such as thermal conductivity, resistance, conductance and thermal capacity. These can be very confusing terms for a lot of students, for a lot of even practicing professionals. We would like to demystify each of these thermal properties and understand their similarities, their roles and also their key differences so that these are not jumbled in the mind of the person trying to practice thoughtful cooling. Thermal conductivity is defined as the amount of heat flowing through one square meter of a material per meter thickness with a one degree temperature gradient across the surface. It can be thought of as a property which is intensive by which we mean irrespective of the quantity of the material this property would not change. For instance density of a material. The density of a material is not dependent on the quantity of the material. For instance it would be absurd to say the density of 1 kg of milk is a certain value. A person just needs to say the density of the material, not the mass of the material, which remains uh, inviolable. Therefore, it is a very basic property of a material, irrespective of the quantity of it. The units that are used to express this are watts per meter degree centigrade. In practice, the vocabulary that would be used to convey the thermal conductivity of a material, as you can see, is devoid of anything related to the total mass of the material. For instance, you would say the thermal conductivity of concrete is 0.8 watts per meter per degree centigrade. As you can see, the total mass of that object is missing in this case. The second property which is related to thermal conductivity but not equivalent is called resistance. It is the measure of resistance of a material or air spaces if there's a gap to heat flow for a certain thickness. This property therefore is dependent on the total quantity of the material available which means the more the quantity of material available, the more would be the res or the higher the resistance would be for that compared to another instance of less quantity of that material. It is the inverse of thermal conductivity after accounting for the thickness of the material, which means the greater the thickness, the greater the resistance. It is defined classically as the thickness of the material divided by the thermal conductivity and therefore it is the inverse, the units are the inverse of the units that were used for thermal conductivity. In practice, the resistance of a material would be conveyed 
by including the thickness of the specific object that you are speaking of. For instance, you would say resistance of a four inch thick wall of concrete. As you can see, we have indicated the thickness which was absent in the previous case. You would say the resistance of a four inch thick wall of concrete is 0.075 meter square degree centigrade per watt. For engineering students who wish to truly understand the resistance of a material, it is imperative to account for the fact that not only do building materials have the physical quantities of the substance itself which impedes the heat flow causing resistance, there are also static layers of air on both sides of a building material which affect the overall resistance that is posed by a specific wall or a roof or a ceiling. This here indicates that ignoring this air film as it's known can lead to a skewing of the resistance value that is calculated by just accounting for the solid material that is uh, comprising the, the wall. This here diagrammatically represents how the resistance of the specific solid object is also influenced by the air layers on the inside and the outside. The total resistance would therefore be the summation of the resistance posed by the outside layer, which is a static air layer, which doesn't move very fast. So therefore it acts as an insulator. The actual wall in this instance and then the corresponding air layer on the inner side or the other side of the wall. The summation of all these three resistances accurately represents the total resistance posed by such a building material. This here reiterates the mathematical relationship which allows you to calculate the total resist resistance of a building material or a wall by and it's equal to the, the outside air layer, the resistance of each of the individual elements in an assembly. For example, a wall could have paint on the outside, could have plaster followed by the, the brick or the concrete block which is the, the, the bulk of the, the building material. On, on the other side, you could have cladding, you could have gypsum, you could have another layer of paint. The resistance of all of those must be summed and the resistance of the inner layer added to all of these to calculate the total resistance of a complex wall assembly. An example of a material with very high resistance properties therefore preventing heat transfer into a space would be something such as mineral wool. This specific insulating material provides resistance to heat transfer by ensuring the presence of a lot of air pockets and air is known to be a very good resistor of heat. A similar principle prevails in the case of what is called extended polystyrene or thermocol or styrofoam as it's commonly known. This insulating material also functions or provides the heat transfer benefits because of air pockets that are enclosed in the structure of the material. A similar principle operates in the case of hollow concrete blocks where each of the blocks not only do they have these large macro air cavities the material itself is filled with small air bubbles and air pockets which impede the flow of heat. Carrying the example further in addition to hollow concrete blocks walls often provide a styrofoam layer or a air gap in the form of a cavity wall which impedes the flow of heat again uh, pr uh, doing this because of the excellent resistance qualities of air. Other commonly used building materials such as autoclaved aerated concrete also utilize the principle of air pockets which impede the flow of heat across a building much better than would a regular brick. Here is a table which provides a snapshot 
of resistance values in the British units or the SI units for a broad spectrum of construction materials and as you can see products or materials that are conventionally used for insulation have very high what is called R values or resistance values compared to the bulk of the building materials that are used in, in making of buildings. For example, brick has a resistance of 0.14 meter square centigrade per watt, which is a small value. Whereas one inches of polystyrene foam, for example, has a resistance of 0.76. So imagine a four inch brick has much less resistance to heat compared to one inches of polystyrene foam thereby indicating the superior resistance properties of insulating materials compared to conventional building materials. In addition to artificial or synthetic insulation materials, there are also natural materials that could be used to provide a similar grade of resistance. As you can see, for example, one inches of cotton bat is not much worse off than one inches of polystyrene foam in terms of resistance both of them are very superior compared to brick as a resistor of heat. The third thermal property which we will now try to understand is called conductance or U-value. In some instances it is also referred to as thermal transmittance. U-value very simply put is the inverse of resistance. Therefore the units are what per meter square degree centigrade. The mathematical relationship between resistance of different wall elements including the inside layer of air and the outside layer relative to the overall U value is as such. One common misconception that practitioners of building physics often uh, fall prey to is calculating the U value by taking the inverse of individual elements of resistance in the wall. For example, the method of calculating which is erroneous would be 1 over R, Ri plus 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. That is the incorrect method of calculating the U value for the overall building assembly. The correct method would involve first summing all the resistances as if they are in sequence and then calculating the inverse of the summation of the individual resistances. The vocabulary or the way of conveying this in professional practice would be to say the conductance of a 4 inch thick wall of concrete is 13.3 watts per meter square per degree centigrade. As you can verify this value is 1 divided by the resistance value that was presented in the earlier part of this presentation. As you can also see, this is the value of conductance is directly dependent on the thickness of the wall or the material that you are dealing with. Therefore, the conductance of 8 inch wall thickness of the same material would therefore be half because the resistance would be double because the thickness would have doubled. So mentioning the thickness of the material is imperative when speaking of resistance or conductance. Here is a table which presents the conductance values similar to the resistance values that we spoke of earlier for a broad spectrum of building materials. And as you can see, the conductance of conventionally used insulation materials such as polystyrene is much lower than the resistance of, for example, brick, which is the reason why a simple brick wall is inadequate to be able to impede large amounts of heat, especially for tropical countries um, such as ours. Here is a snapshot of the U values that are required for complying with the Energy Conservation Building Code of India. And as you can see, these values for different kinds of buildings across different climatic zones are quite stringent if you compare them to the 
table of u values presented earlier which therefore implies that almost no ECBC compliant building can avoid insulation. Just simple building materials such as brick and concrete without insulation will not give you a U value low enough to be able to meet ECBC compliance. As you can see here, for a warm and humid climatic condition, the U values required are lower than the U values required for say for example a temperate zone. Because the heat ingress or the threat of heat ingress would be much higher for a warm and humid condition versus a temperate condition. These are U values required for an ECBC compliant roof assembly. These when compared with the U values of simple materials such as brick and concrete are much lower thereby indicating that the use of insulation is almost imperative to be able to achieve ECBC compliance in uh, modern buildings now. All the U values we saw earlier were related to solid building materials. Here is a snapshot of the U values that one would encounter when dealing with glazing or glass. We all must have heard that glass now or windows now are available in different configurations. Earlier, windows were primarily single plane or a single sheet of glass, which understandably had very high U values as you could verify for yourself by touching a single sheet of glass that is exposed to the sun because a lot of the heat is conducting through that material. However, in more sophisticated windows which are now available, which are known as double glazed or triple glazed windows, the U value drops significantly. For example, in the case of a double glazed window with a low emissivity film plus a gas or an insulating material in between the two layers of, of glass reduces the U value by more than half, thereby indicating that this kind of window would be very effective in impeding the transfer of heat into the building. Let's see if we have been able to understand the relative concepts of resistance and conductance for different kinds of walls, wall assemblies presented here. Here is a conventional brick wall or a representation of a conventional brick wall. This is a autoclave aerated concrete block wall and here is an insulated wall. As you can perhaps already tell that this specific wall type has air which gives it the name aerated autoclave concrete. This one has insulation. Now if we were to rank the U values of each of these wall types, what would be the ranking? As in which one would have the highest U value, which one would have the intermediate U value and which one would have the lowest U value. As this indicates, the U value actually reduces as you go further to the right because of elements that impede heat transfer. In this case, it is the air in the aerated autoclaved concrete which impedes the airflow. However, it does not have an insulation layer. That U value is further reduced from, in this case, from 1.7 to 0.62. By adding an insulated layer or an insulation layer rather, the U value can be further reduced to about 0.42. Therefore, the amount of heat transferring through this wall versus this wall is actually four times more in this case versus this case. It is recommended that to achieve a thoughtfully cooled or a passively cooled building which minimizes energy consumption, we start considering building materials of these kinds or wall assemblies of these kinds rather than the simple wall, wall assemblies which were acceptable before the advent of energy efficiency based thinking. The final thermal property which is often quite difficult for practitioners to, to grasp and is often con uh, confused with insulation is called thermal capacity. 
anecdotally uh, during many conversations with architects students professors we have heard that thick walls which actually provide thermal capacity are often thought of as insulators this indicates a certain rupturing or a um, uh, error in the foundational thinking or the the conceptual thinking of the practitioner thermal capacity is not a property which indicates resistance to heat which is what resistance indicates thermal capacity is in fact about the storage or the delaying of heat transfer across itself so rather than impeding it it actually promotes to some degree the acceptance of heat however what it does do is that it stores the heat long enough or it's a property that indicates the ability to store it for long enough to prevent the heat from actually affecting the other side of the material in consideration therefore it is the ability of a given volume of material to store heat it is a property that indicates how effective the material is in delaying the transfer of heat across it and it is directly proportional to the density of the material and the specific heat density very easy to understand it's about the amount of material or the mass available in a certain unit volume of course the higher the density the more material that's available to absorb and delay the transfer of heat specific heat is also a contributor to thermal capacity specific heat is defined as the amount of heat that needs to be applied or provided to an object to raise its temperature by 1 degree of course the higher the specific heat indicates that this material will be able to store heat for a longer period of time thereby shielding the other side of the building from the effect of the heat the units for this are kilojoules per meter cube degree centigrade of course the higher the density the greater the amount of kilojoules that can be stored per meter cube right as well as specific heat capacity the higher the amount of specific heat or the energy you need to provide to raise the degrees by uh, by 1 indicates a higher thermal capacity since energy is an abstract quantity or an abstract entity it is often difficult to grasp the flow of heat or energy back and forth through a wall and the concept of thermal capacity one useful teaching aid is creating an analogy of a water tank and seeing how the flow rate of water in and out of a tank can be a representation of the thermal capacity for instance here you have a tank with a relatively modest capacity a small capacity here is a tank with a large capacity right think of this as a say a 1000 liter tank and this is a 5000 liter tank both these tanks have a certain amount of flow rate of water coming in from this side and there is a outlet available for the water to flow out when the storage capacity of the tank has been used up let's start at zero hours the beginning of the day as you can see in both instances the water will start accumulating in the tank over time because this is a smaller tank than this one in 4 hours the tank has almost reached its full storage capacity whereas this one owing to its larger storage capacity is very far from overflowing to the other side after 8 hours the situation is compounded even more because the capacity has been maxed out 4 hours ago and all the water that flowed in between these 2 hours has actually made its way to the other side whereas the larger tank has after 8 hours just started overflowing what this indicates is that the larger tank is able to delay the transfer of in this case water which can be thought of as as heat as well more effectively than the smaller tank thereby indicating a wall or a tank of heat is more effective in delaying heat when it has more storage capacity compared to a wall with less 
thermal storage capacity. One nuance of this situation that is often missed or is difficult to grasp is what is the relative benefit of having a large tank versus a small tank if after a certain period of time the amount of water that makes its way in eventually does mix, make its way out once the capacity has been used up. Of course, at this point, there is no benefit to having a large versus a small tank after eight hours. In analogous terms of energy, what this would mean is once the wall has gotten heated up or has absorbed all the heat that it could, every single joule of energy now coming in from the sun will make its way in because the, the, the wall has no more capacity to store the, their energy. However, in reality, this tap or this flow rate is not a 24 hour flow rate. It is a flow rate that stops after 12 hours, by which we mean the sun, which is the source of that energy flow rate, is no longer operating after about 12 hours after sundown, essentially. What happens after sundown is that the wall has, or the, the tank, has the ability to now lose the heat back in the direction that it came from and prevent the transfer of heat or the energy going into uh, the other side. To promote that, what one would need to do is somehow empty out this, this tank using perhaps a tap at the bottom, which would be a drain of heat, or somehow allow that heat to radiate into the surroundings and in, into the night sky. Essentially, the large tank in that case helps by delaying the transfer for so long that the sun sets before the capacity has been exceeded and through other processes of building design, you are able to empty that tank out through the night and get it ready for absorbing energy again in the next 24 hour cycle. Here is a measured case study of temperatures on either sides of a wall that is exposed to the sun in a tropical climate such as ours at different times of the day. As you can see here in the morning at 11 a.m. the outside wall which is under the influence of the radiant heat from the sun is at 32 degrees while the inside in the morning of course understandably is cool it's 21 degrees in this case. The wall is an in-between temperature between the outside and the inside. As the day progresses and as the sun does its work of heating the wall, you can see that the outside temperature starts peaking almost at about 43 degrees centigrade. The wall also has gotten hotter. It has gone from 29 to 35. However, not as hot as the temperature outside, which indicates that there is some resistance to heat flow as well. What is quite pronounced here is that while the outside temperature has risen by about 11 degrees from 32 to 43, the inside temperature has only increased from 21 to 24, which means for 11 degree temperature rise, the wall is able to store a lot of that heat and allow the inside temperature to only increase by 3 degrees. So this indicates a relatively effective thermal storage capacity embedded in this wall. In the night, what happens is, because the outside temperature has dropped so low compared to the wall and the inside temperature that all the stored heat, or not all of the stored heat, but a major component of it starts transferring outside because the temperature gradient is in this direction, which means the wall is warmer than the outside air and hence it starts losing its heat through radiation, through its through conduction, etc. However, because the inside is also lower in terms of temperature than the wall, some of the heat does make its way in as well. This indicates an opportunity to perhaps thicken the wall more or add more thermal mass so that none of this heat makes its way in, which would mean that the wall temperature should never be above the inside temperature. And this can be achieved by adding more thermal mass inside, in improving the density of the material that is being used or using a material with higher specific heat capacity.
This slide here indicates the two primary properties which enable materials to have high thermal capacity. One of them is called time lag and the second one is called decrement factor. Time lag is indicated visually over here in this graph. Time lag here is represented by the distance between or the, the time difference rather between the moment at which the outside air temperature peaks which is in this case right here and the time at which the inside air temperature peaks. To be able to allow for that reversal of heat in the night what a designer would try to do is try to increase the time lag so that the inside temperature peaks only after sundown so that by the time that temperature has peaked you are able to use the reverse flow of heat because of the temperature gradient. Another beneficial factor to increase thermal mass of a material is what's known as a decrement factor. The decrement factor is defined as the relative heights of the temperature, uh, the peak temperature of the outside air and the peak temperature of the inside air. Obviously, to be able to be an effective thermal capacity material, you'd want to have as high a decremental factor or decrement factor and as high a time lag as possible. Both these values are directly proportional to the thermal capacity of the material. Here is a table which indicates the thermal capacities of a broad spectrum of materials from water down to insulation materials. And here is a clear indicator that thermal mass and insulation are two very different properties of a material. As we had seen, thermal ma uh, mineral wool insulation, which is indicated here, had a very high resistance value. Right? The thermal capacity of the same material which had a very high resistance value is actually low. Therefore, mineral wool is not a material with high thermal capacity. It is only a material with high resistance value. To get high thermal capacity, you need to use materials such as this, for example, water. Water here is indicated as having the highest thermal capacity per meter cube per degree centigrade of temperature difference thereby indicating the virtues of using water embedded in walls, using creative techniques such as structure cooling, which will be addressed in other sections of our training, as a way of effectively delaying the heat transfer across a wall. Here is a representation of the effectiveness of using water versus air as a medium to store thermal energy. This here shows how significantly better water is compared to air in terms of th sto uh, storing thermal energy. The size of this cube indicates the amount of air that you need to possess or use to store the same amount of energy that this much smaller volume of water is able to store. The ratio is 3400 is to 1 which means that one liter of water is able to store the same amount of energy and delay the transfer of heat across it as 3400 cubic feet of air or liters of air. This indicates the questionable virtues of air as a heat transfer or as a heat storage medium compared to water which becomes the basis of deconstructing con conventional air conditioning and challenging the predominance of air-based cooling and looking at alternate methods of achieving the same amount of thermal comfort in a much more efficient way using better thermal storage materials. A common source of disagreement uh, that we have encountered between students, academics, professionals about thin walls versus thick walls is centered around the idea of the embodied energy or the embodied carbon emissions of the building material and the sensitivity that architects very uh, meaningfully and, and very meritoriously do display in trying to reduce the amount of embodied energy 
that their building contains. However, it must be borne in mind that while we might reduce the embodied energy of a wall by making it thinner, thereby leading to less quarrying or mining to extract that material from the ground, we might be losing the opportunity to delay the amount of heat or delay the, the time period for which the heat can be stored in a wall by having thicker walls. So there is a classic trade-off which often is quite disorienting and confusing for, for practitioners and they are not able to, to make a decision either way. What should one go with, thin walls or thick walls? Here are two considerations um, which can help influence better decision making. One is that it is admitted that thick walls will, rec will increase the embodied energy or carbon emissions of the building envelope. There is no debate about that. However, when they are appropriately used in dry climates, for instance, or climates where the outside temperature does drop sufficiently in the night so that you can empty that stored heat out, life cycle analysis that has been conducted by us has indicated that the relatively modest increase in the embodied energy or the carbon emissions is completely offset by the sizable reduction in solar heat gained by the building which means that when seen holistically, thick walls in appropriate kinds of climates such as dry climates in India are a beneficial strategy to reduce the overall environmental impact of the building. To just cement, no pun intended, the idea of the difference between insulation and thermal mass is that insulation and thermal mass definitely have common end effects which is they both lead to less heat within occupied spaces however they are very different insulation operates by slowing down or impeding the rate of heat transfer all the materials that provide you with this benefit of insulation have high r values or high resistance values thermal mass operates on entirely different physical principles it is more about absorption and storage of heat rather than impeding of heat and in fact high R values for thermally massive materials would be a detriment because it would impede the flow of heat back to the outside surroundings in the night time which means that the building will not be able to recharge its storage capacity for the next day. Therefore materials which have high thermal mass should be also materials which have moderate R values, not very high R values like insulation. So here's a quick quiz to see if we've understood this idea of thermal mass and its benefits. In which climate does thermal mass not work well? Would it be a climate where there is a high diurnal variation, which means the daytime and nighttime temperatures are sufficiently distinct to create almost different climatic conditions in the same day or in a region with low diurnal variation which means the night and daytime temperatures are relatively similar right this of course would be the case for a hot and dry climate in India this could be a coastal climate in India with high humidity so in which climate does thermal mass not work well the answer to that question is thermal mass does not work well in areas with low diurnal variation such as coastal regions uh, cities like Mumbai Chennai now why is that the reason why thermal mass will not work well in those instances is if you have high thermal mass and in the daytime that wall with high thermal mass has been baked by the Sun throughout the day because the nighttime temperature has not dropped sufficiently below the wall temperature all that heat still remains stored in the wall and is unable to lose it naturally to the surroundings. What this leads to subsequently is that the heat from the walls needs to find some outlet, is looking for a place to get into. It finds that if the interiors of that building are at a lower temperature than the wall, all the heat that has been stored now actually starts acting as a, a source of radiant heat for the occupants inside. This creates adverse conditions 
and does not lead to thermal comfort. Therefore, thermal mask is not a good strategy to be used in places with high humidity. To encapsulate and summarize all the thermal properties that we have discussed up till now, conductance, resistance and thermal capacity, they all have relations with heat transfer but they are distinctively different phenomenon, especially resistance and thermal capacity. Conductance and resistance are in a way mathematically related and also phenomenologically related. So conductance is the measure of heat flow. It is signified by what's called a U-value. Its units are watts per meter square degree centigrade. And the, the relations which govern conductance are the lower the conductance, the higher the heat loss or heat gain, sorry, lower the heat loss or heat gain, which means it is beneficial to have low conductance for a thoughtfully cooled building. Resistance is the exact inverse of conductance. Therefore, the greater the resistance, the lesser the heat gain. So the goal would be to have a building or building materials which have higher resistance in order to prevent the building from heating up. Thermal capacity as indicated earlier and emphasized here again is that it is a measure of the heat storage capacity of the material, not really its ability to delay or conduct heat. And the objective for a thoughtfully cool building should be to use a material with high thermal mass so that the heat loss is or the heat gain is delayed as much as possible. The amount of heat gained or lost through conduction is directly proportional to the area available for heat transfer. The heat transfer coefficient or the U-value as we indicated, this formula makes it quite clear that the heat lost is directly proportional to the amount of conduction, the U-value, right? So the higher the U-value, the more the amount of heat that will be gained or lost. And also the temperature difference, directly proportional to the temperature difference. Once, uh, if there is a greater gradient or a potential difference available between the two temperatures, the more rapid will be the rate of heat absorption or rejection. Therefore, in order to reduce Q, which is the amount of heat gain, one might reduce the area available for heat transfer, which means having buildings, for instance, which have as less exposure to the sun as possible for the same amount of built up or carpet area as it's called, reducing the U value or the heat transfer coefficient or reducing the temperature of the outside conditions so that the amount of heat coming into the building is reduced. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.